Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining. Uh, my name is Tim Nichols, and I'm a research assistant in the Center for Global Health Delivery um, within Harvard Medical School's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, today, we want to highlight some of the innovative work done by our colleagues on the integration Please of slow down for, for TB and COVID-19. Um, as we have seen, the COVID-19 pandemic has had uh, really problematic effects on the ability of TB programs around the world to find and promptly treat uh, patients for TB disease and infection. Um, so efforts at integrated case finding and management for both diseases are a very promising direction Slow as, we down, please. as we reorient ourselves uh, uh, on the path toward TB elimination. Our speakers today uh, are presenting on projects implemented in Karachi, Pakistan and Lima, Peru that utilize artificial intelligence software uh, to read chest x-rays and nu nucleic acid amplification tests uh, for TB and COVID-19. And we hope to disseminate this information to other TB programs who may be interested in implementing projects similar to these in their communities. So let's go ahead and get started with the first presentation. Our first presenter is Rabia Maniar. Rabia is a public health implementer and researcher. Uh, she has experience in implementing programs across multiple disease, infectious disease areas, uh, including tuberculosis, hepatitis, and COVID-19. A key area of focus in her career has been the implementation of a national active case finding for TB program as part of a larger zero TB initiative in Pakistan. Her role then evolved to overseeing the implementation of the comprehensive zero TB initiative aimed at tackling the TB epidemic uh, in, the, in the country. A public health professional who has worked extensively to implement programs at scale, Rabia has integrated critical COVID-19 case detection, screening, and testing services, leveraging existing systems to provide support during the pandemic. Her area of professional interest and expertise uh, revolves around developing integrated systems for disease surveillance and management and optimizing efficiencies for resources, resource constrained settings. So Rabia, thanks so much for taking the time today and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, thanks Tim. Um, hi everyone, uh, good evening from Pakistan and uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you in uh, your respective parts of the world. I'm just going to share my screen so that I can just put up my PowerPoint, pre PowerPoint presentation. Um, are you able to see the slides? Yeah, this looks great. Thanks, Rabia. Okay. Thank you. So, so hi everyone again, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start very, very quickly and I'll go through um, basically what we did in Karachi, Pakistan uh, during COVID. <clears throat> so, okay, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on Pakistan and uh, tuberculosis in our country. Um, as you all may be aware, we are a high burden country. And uh, Pakistan uh, even now ranks about fifth amongst the, uh, the high TB burden countries around the globe. We alone account for about 5.8% of the global TB case burden. And of this high caseload, um, we, we have approximately over 200,000 cases nationally that are missed or go unreported annually. Our, our TB burden is high, we have very high prevalence and incidence, as well as mortality rates. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and its progression across the globe, um, when it started in uh, December on December 31st, when China reported its first case, uh, the, 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 when, by the time the pandemic or, the, or, the, or, the, uh, or COVID-19 came to Pakistan, we were, we were nearing about 26th February when we reported our first case. By late March, uh, there was a quick surge and the number of cases in increased rapidly. And this resulted in um, very stringent provincial lockdowns across the country with intercity travel bans, 
um, within city travel bans. And, and that caused a very debilitating effect on any sort of movement, transport, be it for patients, be it for health workers and, uh, and, and, and citizens at large. Uh, as a result of these lockdowns, access to healthcare was extremely limited, especially in a city like Karachi with, with a massive population of over 20 million people. Outpatient services, uh, elective surgical procedures and diagnostics at large tertiary care facilities across Karachi were shut down. What happened as a result of these citywide lockdowns and uh, shutting down of activities in hospitals, um, we basically, it, it, it had a very, very negative impact on, on our program activities. Activities for us were brought to a halt. Um, our workers were not able to move and we weren't able to, to, to work uh, as routine. And this overall, and patients weren't allowed to move as per routine. And this resulted, as you can see, in steep declines in TB case notification rates. It is at this time that we uh, obviously rehashed our thinking and we pivoted existing zero TB resources and decided to integrate in COVID-19 activities as part of our TB services um, to actually sort of go out and, and do integrated disease-based uh, screening and testing in different areas and settings. How did we do this? Um, we, we, we used trained TB health workers and we trained them on uh, testing for COVID-19. We used existing mobile x-ray vans and we set up integrated screening camps across the city, which I will talk about a little bit more. We leveraged the use of AI software to conduct dual screening for TB and COVID. We also used our existing partnerships that we had set up both public and private across the city to, to, to get support in order to execute these activities. And we, we reworked our existing data collection tools to help integrate disease-based screening for COVID-19 along with TB. So as part of this integrated activities, uh, the first thing that we, that we did was we, we, we redesigned or reworked the algorithm a little bit. And we built uh, an integrated TB and COVID screening algorithm. Considering the overlap of symptoms between TB and COVID, uh, we, what we decided to do was uh, uh, use verbal symptom screen as well as X-ray based screening to identify presumptive or those that required further investigations for TB and or COVID. And so health workers were trained on conducting a verbal symptom screen for tuberculosis as well as COVID-19, also identify any exposure that they may have, individuals may have had to COVID-19. Individuals that were then, or people were then sent for a chest X-ray, which had uh, artificial intel intelligence softwares integrated that also provided scores for both TB and COVID and identified individuals that were maybe at a higher, uh, uh, had a higher suspicion of having either of these conditions. Those individuals that were identified as symptomatic or having X-rays suggestive of TB or COVID or both, were then asked to submit sputum samples for gene expert testing for TB, whereas those that were presumptive for COVID were required to sub submit. And what we did was we trained our health workers to collect nasopharyngeal swab samples for PCR testing for the detection of COVID-19. Using this algorithm and our existing services, we used 12 of our mobile X-ray vans to integrate, to provide integrated coverage and screening coverage across the city uh, of Karachi. And uh, we did this in various settings, as I mentioned. We worked with hospitals, we developed fixed community sites, we did mobile community sites across the city, as you can see in the map. At hospitals, what uh, our teams were trained to provide critical COVID-19 testing support to public and private hospital ERs. As you know, all the outpatient departments of hospitals were shut down, like I mentioned earlier. And so teams were trained to help provide triage outside 
busy ERs, and that helped ease the high burden of inf or influx of patients coming to these ERs. It also allowed access to individuals so that we could continue TB case finding, which was really the need of the hour as well. In other settings, we used uh, uh, our mobile x-ray vans and built, uh, purpose, we designed purpose-built community sites to conduct integrated screening and testing across different locations. These sites were in the form of drive-through service, uh, uh, service delivery for COVID-19 and TB screening and testing. There was a walk-through site that we developed where patients could come in, individuals could come in and get a dual screening. Uh, these, these camps and, and these fixed sites were developed across the city and were, were basically geared to provide access to people near their homes and also allow stringent uh, uh, infection control protocols to be met, which was something which was really important at that time. We also worked with uh, the district governments to set up community camps to allow targeted screenings uh, and testing of contacts as well as screening of essential health workers for both TB and COVID across the city. In doing all this, we were very stringent about the infection control protocols and, and patient safety. Since, since there was not much known about this disease at that point, we followed a very strict phasic approach to disinfecting our vans and our equipment, which in, in, in involved three phases, which was one which was prior to field operations, one during, and the third post operation. Prior, everything was cleaned, all surfaces. Um, we were very, very stringent about the use of material. Uh, during our, our actual screening activities, we made sure that, that all surfaces and uh, equipment was cleaned in between individuals and patients. And then there was a thorough system in place for, for uh, disinfection post activities as well. The patients identified uh, during this time were provided uh, mental health support. We set up a, a mental health uh, counseling and support helpline. And this helpline was aimed at providing proactive support to patients that tested positive for TB and especially for COVID. Um, what, these, what this helpline did was that we, we had placed trained counselors that would provide uh, support, uh, health check-ins, um, guidelines on isolation and adherence to isolation and help relieve any kind of anxiety or fears that people may be experiencing which were related to COVID. Our, our counselors conducted over 42,000 such um, uh, uh, counseling sessions, remote counseling sessions during this time. We obviously needed a very, very uh, uh, active and empowered team uh, during this time. And so a, a key area that we focused on was to ensure that our teams were protected and, and empowered since they were func functioning as work, uh, frontline workers. Uh, they, had, they themselves were very anxious and worried about what they were doing and what, what that would entail. And so we provided support in terms of routine COVID-19 screening for our employees. Uh, we provided uh, safe and secure personal protective equipment to all our staff. We also, uh, there was a lot of contingency planning and WhatsApp groups were, provide, were, were built to provide, uh, to monitor, to disseminate information and provide support to staff. We, we, we got them travel authorization to facilitate travel during lockdown. We also uh, designed online staff counseling and group therapy sessions and trainings on managing COVID-19 stigma, both personally and professionally. Obviously go, uh, going hand in hand with all of this case detection and screening was uh, um, you know, patient care. So we, 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 what we did was that we, we repurposed our existing TB infrastructure to provide care for TB and COVID. In patient care was repurposed. We made temporary arrangements at, uh, at, at our outpatient uh, facility for day admissions of co-infected patients that needed critical care. Our lab was repurposed to allow COVID testing and support, especially to the government and to, to manage the high volumes of tests that were coming in. We used, uh, our model was basically a task shifting model. Uh, we, we used lay health workers and we trained them on, on, on uh, nasal pharyngeal swab sample collection. We built capacity so that there was greater access across uh, uh, the city and we were able to deliver more. 
We also worked on continuation of TB treatment services during this pandemic. And so MDR patients were assessed um, as uh, with, that were assessed as low risk were managed through tele teleclinics like telemedicine. We ensured doorstep delivery of medication and support for TB preventive therapy. Uh, we also ensured on-site availability of pediatric TB physicians to allow follow-up of childhood TB patients. We used telehealth to screen household contacts for TB and COVID. And we got a very resounding and nice response of about 76% uh, uh, was our patient response rate during the outbreak and lockdown. With all this that we instituted, what we saw across the six districts was that uh, our expected case notification, though it dipped in, in, in quarter by, by quarter two of 2020, with, with the onset of these activities and integrated uh, services, there was again uh, a lift and we met about 80% of the expected TB case notification for the city. Similarly, for pediatric TB notification, we actually exceeded the expected TB case notification. Uh, uh, for the for the upcoming quarters, and so when when conducting all of this and when when building this system, uh, I know that there was a lot of learning that 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 we had, and and it was a very very testing time for all of us. But it it, it really brought to light a lot of things that we learned as a, as a, as a result, and we realized that uh, things like use of technology, such as AI, uh, is really integral and the use of digital tools is really integral to build such programs. Uh, countries, especially the LMICs and low, low resource settings really have to think of out of the box solutions and have to think of ways to leverage existing resources to allow a timely response. It is essential to have a good stakeholder engagement and support and to know what the involved stakeholders uh, require to be able to deliver that support. There is a dire need to build a more resilient and decentralized system for TB treatment. And it is through this, these learnings and many more that we were able to deliver this uh, system uh, at that time. Uh, I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Rabia. That was such an awesome presentation. Um, and so for audience members, please feel free to use the Q&A function in case you have questions. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can at the end um, after Daniela's presentation. And so up next, we have Daniela Puma Abarca. Uh, Daniela is a registered nurse with La Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Peru. Uh, and she holds a master's degree in clinical research from La Universidad Autónoma de, de Barcelona in Spain. Uh, she has worked in public health for 10 years, the last three years implementing multiple challenging TB projects. She's currently leading projects for an active case finding initiative for TB in Lima. She coordinates with all levels of public health authorities and with key community stakeholders to promote the uptake of TB screening in Peru. So Daniela, um, welcome and I'll turn it over to you. Yes. Good morning. I will start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Can you please confirm that you can see? I can, yes. I can see the screen. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Well, one of the first questions, one of the first questions that we ask ourselves during the pandemic, why is it that we should only find COVID cases in the community and not TB if the morphology is very similar because a person with a persistent cough and after one month of cough, why couldn't we do screening for TB because our rapid response teams would only go to the households to look for COVID and not TB. And with this, I want to 
tried to tell you that we were trying to do screening of both diseases. For me, it is a pleasure to present to you the information that I'm sharing with you today, which is, with, which is just one small part of the several activities we undertake where we integrate TB screening and COVID screening in the city of Lima. Peru, as you know, is a country located in South America. It has a population of 32 million people and the rate of incidence of TB is 116 per 100,000 population. It is one of the countries with the highest burden of multidrug resistant TB and it is the second country with more cases of MDR TB. During the first year, well, we began undertaking the activities of active TB case finding in 2019 on the side of Lima in three districts of Lima, as you can see on this map on the left hand side of the screen. This is Lima, the city of Lima, the capital city of Lima. We initiated our work in three districts on the first year where we did an active TB case finding these three districts are Carabaillo, Gomas, and Independencia. And this is where we had our activities focused, our active case finding activities focused. These activities were carried out through two mobile units where we had an X-ray machine, a digital X-ray machine. We also had a software which helped us to screen for people who would approach this mobile unit. And as you can see, these pictures are from before the pandemic. We had out of the 30 days of a month, we would open 28 days. We would receive patients from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We would also provide service over the weekends, holidays, etc. And each unit was able to serve around 120 people, up to 200 people per each mobile unit. So as you can see, we were, we were well received. And in February 2020, we were celebrating our first year a few days Later, we received information from the government of bringing all the activities to a halt so as to try to control this pandemic that was emerging. And we received the news back in February of the lockdown that was taking place in China in one way or another, everybody underestimated this and we thought that this was going to stay in China, that this was far away from Peru, it was impossible to reach Peru. And while they were back in China in lockdown, we continue with our activities. However, in March of 2020, they established lockdown in Lima due to coronavirus and this lockdown in Lima forced us to stop our activities. TB related activities because we couldn't go out. We could only go out to do COVID activities and we didn't have any people or any staff to do screening because everybody was staying at home. So we, so from February until June, we had to stop for a few months. And this allowed us to think some areas to think about areas for improvement, to redesign some infection control plans that we already had for TB, but we wanted to strengthen those plans. In June, we made the decision of going back to our activities. We, we had a little bit more information of this enemy, this enemy that we cannot see very similar to tuberculosis. And we started to think about adapting to this new situation. One of the first measures was to screen in more open places. If you see on the previous screens, sorry, let me go back a few slides. This were, even though they were sites on the open air, but they were now narrower streets that didn't give sufficient space for people to walk by. 
So we made the decision of looking for open sites, open places, open locations, like big stadiums, for instance. And as I said, we work in the district of Carabaillo. In this district, thanks to the Ministry of Health, they were able to set up a camp hospital. This camp hospital worked. It is still working and it was opened to take care of patients or persons who had diagnosis other than COVID. This was a field hospital. So we would treat people who had some, any type of symptoms. So that is when we start doing our screenings by adapting the infection plan, very similar to the one presented by Radia. So based on that, we developed and reinforced the activities that we had here with Pakistan. We are very grateful to Pakistan for their support. We also try to improve this type of infection control plan and also ventilation the ventilation of the unit. We incorporated personal protection equipment. We ensured distancing of one person from the other. As you can see from this picture, everybody had to wear a double mask. We had to wear respirators. We had a shortage of masks back then, but we always uh, made sure that our personnel had some sort of protection. And this is how we began doing our screening. This is the curve we had in terms of COVID in Peru. We have had three waves, as you can see. The first wave was between May up to September. In October, this wave came down. Then we had a second wave, which began after Christmas in 2020. And this resulted in a higher number of deaths, which was quite long and then a third surge or wave after the vaccination which is the wave or the surge we experienced on the first few months of this year we are located on this first part of the wave where the first wave had not come down completely, but we did see a decrease in the cases. So we took advantage of that opportunity to go out to the field and carry out these TB activities. And I will present one of these activities right now. We use this diagnostics algorithm. We already, we have already had experience in the use of artificial intelligence. And what we did was to carry out this egg race, which were read through artificial intelligence software the cat for TB and the cat for COVID. Dell gave us the opportunity to use this automated reader for COVID with no additional costs. And we are very grateful for this opportunity as well. As to the cat for TB, we have a cutoff point, which is 50. If the X-rays have a score over 50 of over 50, which is the one that we use even before the pandemic, we would take this to the Socios in Salud laboratory. We have our own laboratory to do the expert, the expert ultra. If we were to have a cut for COVID of over 50, we would follow the same pattern. We use the same score and cut off a point that this software gives us. And we would use the antibody tests, the SARS-CoV-2 antibody test. At first, our country only had antibody tests. Uh, there were very few laboratories doing PCR and the supplies were quite limited as well. We had the opportunity to do some in a small group as of the second week 
because we wanted to do both in order to have a better diagnosis of infection among these people. So they gave us the opportunity to compare, to make a comparison. And in the case of TB, we had people with cat full TB and cat for COVID, which were less than 50, but showed some symptoms highly suggestive of TB or COVID-19. In this case, two or fever, which is something very similar as well. And they would be referred to medical evaluation, which could be done at the same hospital, or in some cases, we could do a household follow-up where we would do the evaluation to see if this person still showed symptoms or required an additional test. All the people diagnosed either with TB or COVID received support so they could go to their healthcare system or network and this healthcare system would provide the necessary care. With TB, we didn't have much problem we did provide support with community health agents or workers though, because they helped us to provide household treatment or what we did was to provide education to the family members so they can implement the DOT strategy, the DOT strategy. We would provide a DOT or DOT video so they can ensure treatment. In the case of COVID, it was much more difficult because we didn't have much treatment other than oxygen and this was limited. So we tried to take the necessary measures to provide support. In spite of that, there were patients who required more oxygen and they had to be hospitalized. Fortunately, the Ministry of Health of Peru tried to support us and we worked hand in hand with the ministry to provide care to these people. Some areas or aspects of interest that we need to take into account. And as I said, I am only presenting or showing information of one single activity. Here we carried out 672 chest x-rays, just to give you an example. Back then, when we were somewhat lowering the number of COVID cases, we had an abnormal chest x-ray that you can see here which is usually what we find in this community. And for COVID, we had 66% for COVID and for TB, we had 27% of our normal chest x-rays. We diagnosed four people who had a TB diagnosis and 44% with a COVID diagnosis. The median age was 40 years. The highest percentage were males. And here I want to specify something before the pandemic for us in Peru, it is very difficult for male patients to go out for screening. We've always had on average 40% of people are male and this limits our work. And it makes us create a specific or targeted strategies for men, for male population, because we know that the greatest number of people affected globally are men. And we had a percentage that even though we were reaching our goals, we still needed to take more men to the screenings. That is what happened with COVID. With, uh, because of COVID, more men are going to this screening and not necessarily to rule out TB, but we harness this opportunity of also screening them for TB. Cough was reported by 251 patients and fever by 21 attendees, which is around 3%. This is one of the signs they presented. 
Well, this is a this is quite an interesting table. We had people with cat full TB, abnormal cat full TB, and abnormal cat for COVID. We had around 22 percent, which had abnormality for both pathologies, according to our software. For abnormal cut for TB and normal cut for COVID, we had 5%. For normal cut for TB and for abnormal cut for COVID, we had 44%. And 29% didn't have any abnormality, neither for COVID nor for TB. In this regard, we have 5% who were positive for cut for TB abnormal and cut for COVID abnormal, but these were positive results for gene expert. Additionally, we had one more person affected by TB, which had for cut for TB, it was normal, but for the cut for COVID, it had a degree of abnormality. So how did we enroll this person? Well, because this person also showed symptoms. And in addition to the x-ray screenings, there is a physician who does follow up to people who either have an abnormal x-ray or who are showing symptoms according to this algorithm. For the SARS-CoV-2, as you can see, the greatest percentage was found here where we have abnormalities for both pathologies, 47%. And in the case of PCR, we also have a significant percentage which was positive, especially when there were abnormalities in both pathologies. This allowed us to detect the person who was currently with a, who had a current infection. Other, inf other results that we take into account as indicators is that we need to carry out 168 x-rays. Sorry, she corrects herself. Yes, 168 x-rays to find one person with expert positive TB. Also, in the case of antibodies, since the load was high, we needed to carry out three tests to find one person with COVID through the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And in the case of PCR, eight people were screened to find one person who was PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Out of the three people, out of these four people, she corrects herself, who were diagnosed uh, with TB, three of them had or were positive for antibodies, uh, COVID antibodies, and they didn't show any symptoms. So perhaps uh, these people just came to the healthcare facility for COVID, which is uh, what we saw in each of the waves. and we were able to detect that they had TB as well. Our activity didn't stop there, but after this, there was a linkage with the contacts, which is another type of information that we hope to share with you. This is the work we did with contacts after the TB diagnosis. Well, this is the, well, the information I just presented to you was recently published on this paper, as you can see here. And we can send you the link for this paper if you wish. Well, this is what I wanted to present to you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniela. That was a really great presentation. Um, love all these great photographs of all the activities that um, you know both Socios and IRD was able to, to do in Lima and Karachi respectively. It's great to, to see how this work played out. 
Um, so again, I think uh, if anyone has questions in the audience, definitely feel free to either use the Q&A function or the chat function. I see that we already have one question um, from the audience in the Q&A. Um, and it looks like it's for Rabia. Um, so Rabia, are you okay to answer a question really quickly? Cool. Yes, I am. Can you please read out the question so I can translate it into Spanish? Thank you. Yes, yep. Yeah, so the question is, has Karachi implemented large-scale PCR screening for COVID-19 cases? If so, have you ever considered uh, leveraging this kind of large-scale PCR screening to screen TB infection in the population? Okay, so I'm gonna answer that. Um, so what we did for COVID was basically lab-based PCR testing and it was at scale. We, we, we implemented a lot of testing uh, in Karachi. It was at scale in Karachi, but it was lab-based PCR. Um, for TB, we used gene expert primarily. So they were two separate mechanisms that we were using for uh, TB case detection and for uh, COVID-19. Um, if when we're talking about uh, TB infection, um, we have, up until now, we have done sort of limited uh, uh, EGRA testing for TB infection, but but we haven't been able to do it at scale because of the sheer costs that that and the implications of the cost that would that it would uh, involve. So yeah, in study settings we have, but we haven't done it at scale. Great, thank you so much. And it looks like we also got another question. This one is for um, for Daniela. Um, how many uh, patients, if any, were RIF resistant in Peru or rifampicin resistant? From the screenings we carried out in the community, it's 25% of the people affected with TB identified who are resistant. Great, thank you so much. And then I guess this question is for um, for either Rabia or Daniela, but uh, did any screenings um, involved at this time, did any of them involve uh, congregate settings such as prisons or jails, or was it just kind of generally in the community? Um, so um, uh, for us uh, at this point, unfortunately, uh, because of the lockdowns, and because of security concerns, we were not allowed to screen in uh, prison settings uh, during this time. We have done a lot of uh, screening for TB in prisons otherwise, but when it came to this, uh, we, we were not. At that point, I think there were security issues and things, and so uh, access was an issue. On our side at Socios and Salud, we did have the opportunity to have access to prisons and jails. And this is because we already had financing to access prisons, female prisons, through the Stop TB initiative. So we did have several constraints. We had to wait for a long time, but as of August in 2020, we were able to access prisons. We carried out screenings in jails and prisons. Six penitentiary centers at the national level. And it was, it helped, uh, the, the screenings helped us because we identified people affected by TB, but there was another limitation. And this was that other people had left jail due to comorbidities. So the government took this liberty of releasing them. So we only found a few people affected, but there were other that were released to the community. But yes, we did carry out activities in prisons and jails. Sorry, Tim, could I just add one very quick thing? Yeah, definitely. I just remembered. Uh, so just for the one prison uh, in, in our city, um, we did do some COVID screening, but then, like I said, uh, it was limited to just some COVID testing. Uh, we could not integrate TB at that point. Uh, aside from that, we've done a lot of that work. I see. Great, thank you so much. Looks like we've got another one in the Q&A. Um, so it says, thank you, Rabia and Daniela. Uh, very interesting and well presented, and I agree. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Daniela if the X-ray uh, or the CAD machines were available since before the pandemic, or if it was purchased later. 
and if all these resources will be continued to be used permanently for TB in the future. Yes, we acquired and procured the machines in 2019. So we had been doing active TB case finding since 2019, and then we adapted it for COVID. And from this activity that I mentioned that uh, lasted a few months, we started working along the Ministry of Health. And currently the Ministry of Health through the Global Fund has acquired 14 X-ray machines, portable machines that are helping us with screening. So our small scale project has scaled up as you can see, and this is something good for the community. Great. Uh, and then, so there are a few questions in the chat as well that I'll, I'll try to go through. Um, why was testing for TB using Gene Expert uh, not integrated with COVID-19 testing? In our case, it had to do with our resources. We had limited resources. And what we tried to do, and it has been quite challenging, is that in spite of having the diagnosis, people could not isolate. So we tried to invest on strategies to isolate the people and to meet the requirements and to comply with the safety measures. We invested on tests, but it was not only the tests. So we also had to handle and properly manage their resources. That is why we couldn't run many more tests. And our laboratory was one of the first five or six laboratories which manage PCR. So we had to take care of our patients, but we also had to support the Ministry of Health in other case findings that they were carrying out. Great. So Robbie. Tim, could you repeat yeah. that question? I seem to have missed it. Yeah, the question was, why was testing for TB using Gene Expert not integrated with COVID-19 testing? Yeah, so I think, yes, um, I think that this similarly was a function of uh, constrained resources, uh, you know, lack of availability of uh, the kind of uh, expert cartridges that and the volumes that were required, uh, the sheer volumes that we were testing. And, you know, like, like uh, uh, Daniela mentioned, we were also providing support to the government. And so the, the kind of volumes of samples that were being received by our labs are really um, uh, it required us to, to shift to lab-based PCR testing just to manage uh, throughput. Great. Um, looks like we have one more question in the chat. Um, does anybody know if there is a feasible integrated screening strategy, ideally on one testing platform with one specimen, uh, e.g. an oropharyngeal swab? If not. So the question is if there is a, a one sampling technique, such as like just the use of to do to do tests for both. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of that at, the, at, at this point. I see. I do know that G uh, expert can be used uh, to process both uh, COVID and uh, TB samples. But at this point, um, samples for TB are primarily sputum. Uh, 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 induced sputum and uh, this, these are swabs. Gotcha. I think we have time for maybe one more question before we, we wrap up and say goodbye. Um, this question is in the Q&A, it's for Rabia. Um, could you expand on the use of CAD? Um, what was the AI software and uh, what was the threshold score used in, in Pakistan? Sure. So um, yes, we did use CAD. Um, our threshold score was 70. Uh, this is a score that we had been using pre-pandemic as well. And it had been adjusted to our population. We've done a lot of uh, uh, sort of research and, and, and work on figuring out the uh, efficiency of this score. And so we used 70. Um, we did use additional software that was, uh, that was provided 
to us, uh, which came free of cost. Um, the software uh, uh, was called was was uh, called QXR, uh, and that did not essentially provide a score, but actually uh, provided a, a risk assessment uh, for TB as well as COVID. And so. Um, presumptive were identified based on a high or medium risk for COVID-19. Um, and so we use that particular software for COVID. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I think this will probably be a good uh, time to wrap up because we're approaching the end of the hour. Um, but I just want to say uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us. Thank you to Daniela and Rabia for such wonderful presentations. Also, thank you to Maria Fay for your interpretation work. We really appreciate you being here, it's really amazing that we could um, do this in two different languages. Um, yeah, and so uh, a recording of this will be available. We can we can share it with our networks uh, afterwards. We'll put it on the Zero TV website um, so that you can all access it there. Um, and yeah, until next time, um, hope to see you at our next webinar sometime soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye everyone.